Um, so in this demo, we'll go over Rhino and the rendered view and adding materials and playing with lighting. Um, so here is an example um, that I've created right here using the Farnsworth house, which I've been using, you know, throughout uh, the project as demonstration for you guys. Um, and you see here, I've, uh, I have my topography context in, um, but I also started by setting my view. So I started, you know, panning around my model, trying to figure out what's the best angle uh, to, you know, properly portray this. What is a, what is, I'm starting to think about the composition of the, re the exterior rendering I'm going to create. So I first started by, you know, selecting a view and saving it. And then I started constructing a little bit more of my composition just by sort of diagramming in Rhino. So what I've done here is I've, you know, just with the simple box command, I've, um, I've thought about putting my, my building hypothetically in some sort of uh, rocky hillside context. So what I've done here is I've kind of just masked out in Rhino where I want um, this sort of hillside and, and rocky area to go and kind of thinking about a little bit of entourage here where some smaller rocks might go as well. Um, so from there, I also um, like going into rendering and lighting. Um, let me remove all my lights to, to sort of demonstrate this idea. There's a light. Okay, so I've just deleted all my lights for <laughs> so we can hop back into this demonstration. So the first thing to play around with um, with lighting is the sun command. So if I type in sun, I get this box that pops up and I need to press on and I can also, um, so two options with the sun is I can either control the sun position manually, which means I get to play around with the sun position by dragging these um, toggles right here. So I can change the angle of the sun or, or the direction of the sun. And I can also change um, the azimuth or the angle that the sun is at. So I'm gonna say maybe that's good for me. So that's the first step. Um, the next thing that we can do to add lighting, and actually I'm gonna make this more of a nighttime sort of scenario. So nighttime, sun sets in the west. Or maybe my, Maybe it's facing the other way. Let's keep it like this. Um, the next thing I can do if I'm, if it's more of a sunset or, or nighttime uh, rendering I maybe want to create is to add some some lights. So, what I can do is to to start bringing in lights. I need to go to my render tools tab. And here you'll see that there are a bunch of different um, types of lights. So a spotlight, um, very self-explanatory, it's just a spotlight. It's kind of like a, a task light that illuminates a, a specific portion of area. A point light is basically the equivalent of a bare light bulb. So it uh, shoots light out in every single direction. Uh, and then we have our directional light, which um, is basically like a large mass of light that only <laughs> goes in one direction. So if you could think of sort of a, a like a, 
a light in the ceiling grid, like a drop down ceiling grid that you, you typically see in school, that would be similar to a directional light or similar to the rectangular light. We also have linear lights and um, a bunch of different lighting options that I've actually never really played with before. Um, <laughs> so we'll start here by creating a linear light. So all I need to do is just click and drag or specify a light length. And one thing that's kind of frustrating about the the light tool is that obviously it shows up in the rendered view, but I can't edit it in the rendered view. I need to find my light here in my other viewports and start moving it around to start playing with the lighting. So I can move that down here. Um, I can also edit the lights by typing in lights. And so this light that I've just added is called unnamed. And here I can see that it's the linear type. I can also change the intensity. So I could change this to 50. Um, just for reference, intensity at 100 is basically the equivalent of the sun in Rhino. So you see there, it kind of got a little bit dimmer. I'm gonna turn off my skylight so that we can see the effects a little bit um, better. So now we're moving around our light. Maybe I want my light on the interior, somewhere located around there. And then perhaps another light in my, in my, sort of patio. <laughs> so if I turn these off, you see how it gets pretty dark. But putting on these lights, we start to illuminate the space. And it also illuminates the surrounding context a bit. But um, when we bring this into Photoshop, we'll be covering all of this anyway. So. Uh, that won't matter too much. We can also change the color of our lights. So right now it's a bright white, but I can change it to a bit more of a yellow. Um, so that's just not as intense. And for whatever reason, maybe we'll make this one green, <laughs> just so you guys can see how that changes. Um, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm starting to get a sense of what kind of atmosphere I wanna create for my, for my, um, my rendering. Um, so that's, that's ba a basic intro to lighting. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? I'm going to start making a directional light so you can see how that works. Any questions? Um, how'd you get the spotlight to again? Sorry. The spotlight? Yeah. How did I get to it or how did I... Yeah, how'd you um did you just type in command for it? Like, yeah, how'd you so open it up? You can so you can type in probably spotlight. So you can type it or you can go under your render tools tab. And oh, okay. spotlight is just located right here. So I okay. can just draw it in. So now you see the effects of that spotlight. So spotlights are very, um, like they kind of create this dramatic sort of 
um, boundary from where there is light and where there isn't. We can also edit the spotlight by playing with the control points here. So if I click the spotlight and I click a control point, I can also play around with how intense that um, light is. So the closer I bring it into the center, the less um, sharp it becomes. And then I can also do the same here, make it wider. So the wider I make it, the further it goes away from that center ring, the less um, focused it becomes. It becomes more diffuse rather than like a sharp edge. Um, so yeah, that's that. Any other questions about lighting? Okay. <laughs> So the next thing we'll go over is um, in the rendered view, just applying some materials. So the Farnsworth house is basically all white, but for the purpose of this demonstration, we'll, we'll give it other materials and textures. So for example, let's make the roof maybe, and let me unlock my layers. Um, so you'll see here that I have my glass walls and that I've given it this plastic material where as uh, Joseph has already experimented with. Um, you can control how transparent the material is and also how reflective the material is. Um, Rhino is not really that great with reflectivity. <laughs> But um, it gives you like a good sense of um, the material. The so let's go back to assigning other materials. So maybe I want to make my roof. Um, I don't know wood, for example. So we can go under the material type here, and so there's a bunch of default materials. So you can assign it a paint color, which will basically just give it an overall color. Same thing with um, plastic. You could also give it an overall color. Um, and we can also go under more types here. And by going under more types, we can import from a file. And so when you do that, it'll basically open up a folder under your Rhino installation. And you get to pick from a variety of um, additional textures. So I can go under the wood folder and you'll see here there's a bunch of different types of um, wood textures. Um, maybe I want a pine. Let's do maritime pine. I don't know what it'll look like, but we'll see. Um, so we'll give it the color. We don't need transparency. You can bring in a bump texture. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with different rendering programs, but for example, V-Ray, you can bring in an image that sort of defines a texture and overlays it with the material that you've assigned here. And just gives it more uh, a realistic view. Um, Self-illumination, that basically makes it sort of like a light, which we don't need. And we can play around with the reflection and the polish. You can import an image, right? Like a yeah. texture? So, <laughs> I was yeah. just about to show you that okay. now too. So I'll do my floors with that one. So for floors, again, we'll click the material thing. We'll go to type and we'll do custom. And so when you click custom, it's kind of similar to when I opened up that file, like they're the same settings, but all you need to do is to assign a color, you need to click to assign texture and that'll open up all your folders. And I guess it opened up 
this project of mine, but uh, let's see, let me go to my documents, my textures library. Let's do this one. So you see uh, there how I just mapped it to mm -hmm. there. Um, the thing about Rhino and materials is that it's very finicky with um, scaling material. So obviously like this is completely out of scale. <laughs> um, like a wood floor would not have, you know, the knots and, and the ridges of the wood being so zoomed in and large. So, oops, didn't mean to not save that. Let me just redo that again. And okay. So I don't know if it's worth showing you guys this at this point because I don't want you guys to get too caught up in um, toggle materials panel. So it has to do with this mapping, this texture mapping uh toggle right here so there's a couple ways to scale a material i can apply a box mapping and when i do that uh i select oh it's locked that's why i select my target object which would be that floor to enter. And then I would need to create a bounding box. So I'm going to, oops, let me do this again because I want to draw a bounding box, not select a bounding box. So I'll just draw a box around that entire object. Uh, yes. And I need to show that object and actually, so I it's there. All I need to do is click the show mapping widgets. And it'll ask me to select the object that I just mapped that around. So you'll see here, that I have this box. And when I just drew this box, it actually changed the direction of my material, but I can also control the scale of it by now playing around with this box right here. So if I rotate the box, oops, make sure you have your mapping widget selected. If I rotate the box, it'll rotate the texture. And I can also make the texture smaller this way and that way as well. And that starts to look a little bit more realistic. And so what it also does is it, um, it tiles that texture as well. So you can continue making that smaller and it's not like the the image that you're using will just be cropped and then the rest of it will be white space. It'll just tile it across the surface. So that's like a quick introduction to rendering and applying materials in Rhino, but I will say that, um, I mean, you can give this a go, but it's not going to be easy, especially with the complex objects that in um, buildings that you guys have modeled. Um, when objects get a little bit more crazy, um, and more complex. Like this is a very simple um, box object. So it worked very simply, but the more complex it becomes, the, the harder it is to control 
um, your, your texture mapping. So I'm actually gonna show you how to do some texture mapping in Photoshop um, and not just by, you know, <laughs> using the distort tool, but an actual uh, tool that I just learned recently, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I'll show you guys how to, you know, map textures to a surface in Photoshop. So is that, is that also why, sorry, I cut you off, but is yeah. that also why people use Lumion 3D rendering software to do that? So, you know, Lumion, Enscape, Twinmotion, V-Ray, mm -hmm. like literally anything else, like people hate the Rhino render and it's, you know, with reason, it's a very, it doesn't export like nice images and it's also like um, very difficult to use and control. So that's definitely why people use those other programs for rendering. Um, so to answer your question, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so, but just so you guys know, like, you know, that's just how you apply materials in, in Rhino and also how to set up some basic lighting. So, I mean, I've done quick rendering in Rhino just for like, you know, a mid crit or something, but like for a final crit, it's really not worth, you know, the time and effort. Um, so yeah, you would just continue for each object. Like let's make my columns here. My columns are metal. So I'll select a metal and I'll select the color, which would be steel. And so like you see here, like I made it a steel texture, but it's very flat. It doesn't feel like there's any like texture to the steel itself. Like, of course, steel won't have as um, a unique a texture as wood does, but still it looks like nothing even happened. So that's why I highly recommend like using other programs or, or Photoshop. Um, okay, so from there, I'm gonna go back to my set view and I'll go back to my main view. So let's say I, I you don't have to do the lighting or do all the rendering, but I wanted you guys to see like how to do that. So you kind of have an idea. Um, we can also just export a basic rendered view or Arctic view to Photoshop. So we've gone over this before, but just for a refresher, all you need to do is go to file, make sure you're in the view that you would like. Go to file and print. then you'll have this um, dialog box show up. It'll ask you your destination. You'll set the dimensions of the image. Make sure you um, your output color is print color or display color. Um, we'll make sure we're in our perspective to view. This is the, the view that we've saved. And the scale here does not matter. Uh, we can set margins if we wanted to, so on and so forth. Um, so I've already saved my image for the demonstration purposes, but you know, you get the idea. You just hit print. It'll ask you where to save, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to close this, and I'm going to close my Rhino. Uh, let me stop sharing for a moment. So now I'm going to hop into Photoshop. But before I, I do that, do you guys have any any questions about Rhino? OK, <laughs> I'll take the silence as a no. OK, so I am going to share my screen now. So this is the Photoshop tutorial. Um, so this isn't really finished whatsoever, but this is something I worked on um, a little bit last night and this morning to kind of give you guys an idea of 
you know, what, what you can do in Photoshop um, just from, you know, exporting an image of your Rhino model. So this is by no means, you know, completed, but um, this is the, the Photoshop file I was working on. And so I basically decided um, that I wanted it to be in sort of like a field, maybe on the edge of a cliff <laughs> with a rocky um, sort of context and mountains in the background. Um, and of course, for your guy, for you guys, your renderings will be more specific to the site that you have chosen. So this is what I've ended up with so far, but I want to show you guys how I got here. So I'm going to turn off all my layers. So you'll see here, this was my original base image. And I've organized all my different layers into different elements so sky and landscape. And I've really only gotten to work on sort of the, the context, creating the context. Um, so what I've done here, um, and first I'll show you how I actually imported this texture and properly mapped it to this um, plane right here. So there's a new, um, like if you have the latest version of Photoshop, there's an, a fairly new um, tool that you can use. It's called, um, what is it called? Vanishing point. So it's under your filter option right here. And basically what it allows you to do is if you have a, a texture file, or not a texture file, just like a, an image of a texture. Let me go to my textures folder. And again, for the purposes of the demonstration, I'll just use a brick texture again, even though the Farnsworth house does not have brick anywhere. <laughs> um, so what it basically allows me to do is if I bring this image into Photoshop, like normally what I would have to do is I would have to go to edit, um, transform and distort. And I would have to start dragging my image here to match these corner points. And that would be essentially how I would have to map my texture in Photoshop. But there's actually an easier way to do this. So I'm gonna hit undo. So what I can do here by using the, let me delete this. Actually Photoshop is frozen for me. Oh, there, just kidding, no it is. Yes. So what I can do is when I have my base image layer selected, and it's important that you know you remember to select the base image because it's basically going to overlay the texture onto that original base image. You go to your filter and go to vanishing point. And what that will do is can you see this extra screen right here? Okay. So what that will do is it brings up this extra box and you'll see I've already created um, a plane right here, but I'll create another one is I need to create a plane that signals to the texture where I need to um, map to. So I'm basically going to draw the extents of the roof. So that is generally the plane. And you'll see here that it's highlighted blue. If it's not highlighted blue, like if it's red, that basically is saying that Photoshop does not like uh, the plane that you've created because it's also using um, like artificial intelligence to read the image and also read where the plane sort of exists. So we need to make sure that our, our points are actually mapped correctly to the object. So 
that's about right. And then what I can do from there is if I go, I can hit OK. And when I hit OK, that basically just saves it. We don't have to, to worry about uh, losing our information. Hit OK. So what I can do now is I can select this entire image and hit Control C, which of course is copy. And I'll go back here and I will open up again my, my vanishing point, my vanishing point filter. And then I'll just copy or paste that texture into the, the filter um, dialog box. So then all I need to do is I need to drag it over onto the roof of my um, building. And I can start to move it around and scale it as I need. So to scale it, I'll do Control T, which is the shortcut for the transform tool. And I can start shrinking the material as I need. Which is kind of like frustrating a little bit because you have to do it within the extents of the of the panel or the plane that I just created. So I can do that and then I can also stretch it if I wanted to. And there I go, there it is. And then you'll see it updates into my Photoshop image. So you'll see here, like the texture is pretty out of scale still. So what that means is that what I should do is I should bring this object in here. Paste it. And I should tile it because when I stretched it, it basically like stretched the image a bit. Um, so I can start tiling my bricks. And that should be a little bit closer. And then I'll merge these layers by selecting all of them and then right clicking and merging my layers. Okay, that's done. So I'm just gonna make this a bit smaller so we can look at it. All right, it's thinking. All right, there it goes. So now what I can do is I can do this basically again. I'll select the image, I'll hit Control C, go back to my filter. So let me turn that off so that's not so confusing. All right, so I'm not sure what's going on here, but I can't remove this. So let me just go to my history and undo all of that.
but I think you guys get the idea. Does that make sense? Um, so like when I tile it and I kind of copy and paste it into that, it'll make it so that I have more, more room to kind of shrink things down and not have everything be like, if I shrunk it down within that plane, I'll have a whole portion or a whole area that will be blank and doesn't have that material applied to it. But if I kind of start to tile it myself and then put it into that vanishing point filter, then I should be able to kind of, you know, tile it across the entire um, surface itself. Um, so actually maybe I'll bring that back. Okay, so that was one part of creating my Photoshop file, but really where the magic kind of happens in Photoshop is um, creating the context. So I'll start here with the landscape. And if I bring down this drop down, you will see all the layers that I've used to create this landscape right here. So if I just turn all of these off, like I want to stress to you guys that um, Photoshop, like rendering in Photoshop is all about taking a bunch of images and starting to merge them together, sort of collage them together. So you'll see I've started bringing in mountains from various images. These are two different images. I could blend them better together better. That wasn't a very good job, but <laughs> um, for demonstration purposes, it's good enough. I start to bring in some grass and rocky textures, some more rocks, grass. So all throughout this, it's a lot about trial and error too, but I'm, I'm bringing in several images I'm using my clipping masks here. And what that allows me to do is I can start to delete parts of my images without deleting it forever. So I can select uh, the white box right here and I can select my paintbrush. I'll make that a bit smaller. You'll see I'll, I'm able to start, what layer is this? That's not the best one to demonstrate with. Um, this is why you should also name your layers, but. So I can erase portions. Get wrong layer. I can erase portions and I can also bring portions back without losing all my information. Um, so then, you know, more layers, more layers of information, overlapping pieces. I bring in more grass to kind of give a little bit more texture, more site context. And then what I did here, and I'll do it again so you guys can see, but this is a layer that if I turn everything else off, I've used the clone stamp tool, which is this tool right here, which basically allows me to select any portion of the image that the layer um, I'm currently on. And I can change the brush size. Uh, or the brush type. So those are my general brushes. I have downloaded a series of grass Photoshop brushes. And what I can do with that is, you'll see here, it gives me um, a brush that's in the shape of, of grass. So what I can do here with my clone stamp tool is if I hold Alt and I select any portion of that image, I can start to draw in extra grass. 
So if I do that again, but in a new layer so you guys can see, let me bring back all my, all my layers here. So you'll see the difference here, how like this definitely feels like a, like an image that was just kind of slapped on and it doesn't really feel too much like it fits within the context. When I start to play around with these brushes and sort of start to paint grass and, and context, it starts to blend the items together. So like what I did here, for example, I can in a new layer, make sure we make a new layer. Um, I, when I do my clone stamp, I want to make sure I'm first within the layer that I want to uh, reference from. So I, if I want to reference this grass layer in the front, this layer right here, I want to make sure I'm in that layer. And then I'll hold Alt and select anywhere. And then I'll go to my new layer, this layer 19. Let me turn this off. And I can start painting grass all around. And Oh, I know why it's not working. So you might want to, you, you're going to have to reference from multiple locations. You'll notice that because I chose down here and when I tried to place context there, it wasn't working because basically I've ran out of room in the original grass image. Um, so I've added all that there. And then I can also play with my brightness and my different um, adjustments. So I can change the hue and saturation of the grass because right now I feel like it's a little bit too, too green. I can, oops, make sure that, <laughs> Make sure that when you do this, that you enable your clipping mask. So when you do that, you right click this layer and you create the clipping mask. And what that does when you see this little arrow is that it makes sure that any edits that you're doing when you're editing that hue and saturation only happens to this layer. So if I start to edit this again, you'll notice that it only changes that grass right there that I've, that I've pasted in. So I think originally it was pretty, pretty green. If I make it a little bit more orange, it starts to feel a little bit more like it fits within the picture. Um, so that's how I did that. Um, I'll just turn this off and turn on the original. And so I started adding even more context. I added a sky, uh, pasting that in the background. Let me turn on my background layer. And then I've also added in a path. So if I do this again, just so I can show you guys how I did this, where is all I did here was I drag and drop this image into my Photoshop. I turn the opacity down just so I can figure out like, you know, kind of where it wants to sit. Where are the steps into my building? Kind of right here. I turn on my layer mask or my clipping mask. And I start to, oops, make sure you're actually in the white box right here. I start to erase some information. I start to erase some of you know the harsh lines of the image. If I turn this back up. Now we start to see like it feels like I have a path leading to 
my my building. So basically like Photoshop is a lot about just like layering images upon images, playing around with transparencies, erasing certain portions, um, et cetera. And so um, at this point, maybe I'll say that's good enough for, you know, landscaping. I might want to start adding in some lighting. Um, or maybe not yet, actually, because this is more of like a daytime rendering. So let's say that I've decided that my rendering's in a good place. I would add scale figures in this file. Um, you know, birds, if you want to <laughs> add birds to your rendering, any sort of that entourage and context, additional trees if you wanted to. Um, I'm not going to go through that right now for the sake of time, but what I would do then is I would just save your image as it is. Um, you could save it as a JPEG or a Photoshop file without the layers. Um, and so that's what I've done here. Um, so it, I've had this base image that I've created. And now I can start adding different filters to make it feel a little bit more um, ephemeral if I wanted to make it feel a little bit more stylized. So <clears throat> I've added these different filters. I don't have to use all of them at the same time, but they're just things to play around with. And how I, I did that is you'll see down here, there's this little circle that has, you know, that's half filled. If I click this, there is an option called color lookup. And what this does is Photoshop has a series of what's called LUT files. And LUT files are um, typically like they've been used in uh, cinematography and it's basically like applying like, you know, a camera like filter, making it feel more like either very saturated or making it feel very desaturated and gloomy. So basically that's kind of like the same thing in Photoshop. So I can bring down this drop down menu and it gives me a bunch of preset uh, filters. So I can start, you know, playing around with different filters. I don't know why we would want <laughs> that one, but that's a little too saturated. That takes away too much information maybe. Um, to make it, you know, feel like it's in a volcano, I guess. Um, so the one I chose before was Candlelight Cube, and that I thought that was kind of like a nice middle, um, kind of desaturated a little bit, but not too much. I can also play around with my transparency here. If I thought that, you know, the filter was way too much, I can play around with how much of it I want to expose it. Um, I can also add some vignetting. I think that was a little too dark. So vignetting is a really nice way to hone in on the central focal point of your rendering. And so what I wanted to do was basically darken sort of the perimeter of the whole image so that I can really just focus on the architecture itself. So what I did here was I, if I disable my layer mask, all I did was use my paint bucket tool and just cover the whole thing black. I turned down my opacity and then I used my clipping mask here um, so that I can start erasing that black, um, you know, block that I put over the entire thing. Um, so I can go back and edit it um, with my black and white paint. So if I wanted to bring back some darkness, I can do that. Or I can erase what I just did. I can make it more less dark. Etc. Um, 
So yeah, do you guys have any any questions? Any <laughs> any other? Are you guys interested in in learning Photoshop and um, how to like create very nice renderings in Photoshop? 